Sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, friends, neighbors, comrades, all citizens of the world, wherever you're going, wherever you've been, and wherever you're at, we welcome you to the Live from the Heartland show here on YouTube. New episodes air every Friday at 9 a.m. Central Time with individual interviews posted throughout the following week. I'm your host, Michael James, encouraging you to take the chain from the brain to get back in the people's game, because it's time to move from the lower level to the higher, from the shallower to the deeper, from the one-sided to the many, and from the abstract to the concrete. So without further ado, let's get it on. Hello, all you citizens of the world, and welcome to another edition of Live from the Heartland. I'm Michael James. I'm your host today. And we are recording it on June 3rd, Monday, and it is for the week of June 8th. Our guest today will be our political analyst for a number of years now, Don Rose. And we are going to then talk with Marguerite Horberg of the Hot House here in Chicago about all things Hot House, their trips, and their upcoming film festival. Um, a couple of good things I'd like to share. In Colombia, campesinos have planted nearly a million trees in deforestation hotspot in the Colombian Amazon. More than 700 campesinos from municipality of Cartagena del Chela have started restoring more than 11,000 acres of degraded rainforest in one of Colombia's deforestation hotspots. Let me just say there's a lot of good things happening in Colombia around the climate. I believe there's going to be a climate conference there in the next year, and there are big plans. They're taking some big steps to really change the way things are done, the way people use energy and where they get their energy. Another good thing was workers at a Georgia school bus maker known as Bluebird. I always like seeing the Bluebird logo on those, those school buses have approved <clears throat> their first union contract. So the UAW is clearly making inroads into the South, even though they did lose the Mercedes election in Mississippi. One thing I'm not so sure is good is the Biden is due to this week, probably on Tuesday, would be passed when you hear this show or view it, an executive order to temporarily seal the border with Mexico when there is a surge. It will also limit the asylum opportunities for people who come here seeking asylum. This is not too far away from something that Trump proposed and Democrats were critical of. Clearly, this has to do with the election coming up and the image of what issues have to be dealt with. Something I'd like to call your attention to is a site called The Oath. The Oath. And it's about where you donate your money to. Many of you, I assume, get lots of emails asking congressional candidates and others to donate to uh, their campaign, and this site really helps sort it out. So check out The Oath, because if you're going to donate money, which is a good thing, you might want to really consider where you're going to donate it to. Some good things, and we're going to talk about a little bit later with our guest, Don Rose, there was an election in Mexico this past Sunday, and a woman is way in the lead and certainly is going to be the winner. Uh, that is a good thing. By the time you see the, see or hear this show, Mexico will have a new president-elect, uh, and it is a woman and it is a Jewish woman. Take note, please, that this Saturday after the show, I'm going to be at the Uptown Art Fair at 935 West Wilson with my photographs and books. This is all part of the fifth annual Uptown Walk, which showcases Uptown's public art, features new murals, a block party on Clifton, various exhibits at various businesses. So Saturday afternoon, Wilson Avenue and nearby locations in Uptown will be a good place to be. Okay, I'm going to take a little short musical break. Engineer Hal is going to pick a tune and we will be back with our first guest. Stay tuned here on the left end of your dial or however you are getting live from the heartland today.
Welcome back to Live from the Heartland for the week of June 8th. And I'm really honored now to bring on our longtime political analyst for a number of years, the one and only Don Rose. Good afternoon to you, Don. Good morning to you. I know. Well, you never know when people are watching it, so I was winging it there. But, uh, you know, it is a year of elections around the world. Uh, we've had Spain. We just had Mexico this past weekend. We had South Africa. Looks like Modi's winning in in uh, India, and I uh, wish he wasn't. And we've got Great Britain coming up, and of course we have the U.S. coming up. So uh, let me ask you right off the top, what's your sense of democracy around the world? I think it looks to be uh, somewhat in jeopardy. You know, I, I'm very disturbed uh, um, about uh, India. It's the world's largest uh, country in population. And uh, after what seems to be many, many years of, uh, you know, as long as it's been uh, uh, liberated from uh, decolonized, whatever you want to call it, from, from uh, 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 Britain, uh, it has, you know, it's gone through all kinds of changes, but I've never seen it to my recollection, um, a split where you've got a government that is uh, um, Hindu, which is, of course, the majority religion there, but anti-Muslim. Uh, you know, um, uh, it, it's setting itself up, uh, the Modi government um, is setting itself up for, uh, uh, for civil war or... Um, you know, uh, suffocation of a very substantial number of uh, uh, Muslims there. Um, I think that's the single most uh, uh, disturbing. Uh, in Britain, of course, we can look forward to uh, Labour, a rejuvenated Labour Party uh, taking over after, what is it, 14 or 15 years of conservative government. and. Uh, we may see uh, some some good happening there. You know, they've been the conservatives have been trying to take away every uh, benefit that was first awarded uh, when uh, labor took over after World War II uh, and created uh, you know a quasi-socialist government, um, and they've been stripping it stripping it away in a way in a way. They permitted the uh, they permitted the uh, health system to deteriorate. Uh, it really needs a new direction, and uh, it's certainly going to get it. The only question is the size of labor's majority when that happens. Uh, Spain, it seems uh, rational. You know, we haven't. It's, there, there's no uh, danger points, and uh, you know they're treating their. Uh, uh, separatist uh, voters, uh, or the leaders of the separatist vote, uh, fairly. You know, uh, so I'm I'm not particularly worried about what's going to happen there. Uh, Mexico will get uh, an amazing uh, combination. Uh, its first woman uh, president, and it's a nice Jewish lady. It is. <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> the, the, the uh, Mexicans are going to have to learn how to sing my Yiddish mama in Spanish. Now, that'll be good. Maybe <laughs> we'll get them on the show singing it. There uh, we go. So let's bring it to uh, back to the United States. And before we go to the Trump verdict, um, let me ask you about uh, where you see things at on the U.S. election coming up in November. Uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of talk, a lot of polls, a lot of dismissing of polls. Uh, I tend to be optimistic, but that's my nature. What's your take on where the election is at? Well, I think it's, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the Trump verdict is tied into it. But uh, I, too, have uh, some optim optimism. Uh, there were signs, early, uh, early signs of a uh, turnaround in People's thinking about uh, inflation. Uh, there's still fantastic ignorance of uh, 
the real economic situation. There's still people in this country who think, uh, um, you know, the market is down and the uh, 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 economy is bad and unemployment is bad when we've got record low unemployment. We've got particularly record low unemployment for African-Americans and minorities, um, categorically, you know, uh, so let me uh, let me throw in here. I just saw a headline somewhere that talked about a gap between the way a lot of Americans view the their own personal economy and the nation's economy. More positive on their own personal situation, but a bigger gap on uh, where they see the country's at. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. Um, people who, uh, uh, although they complain about the economy. More and more people are satisfied with where they are, even though they have a misguided view of where the larger country is. Now we've got, you know, something like five and a half months or thereabouts to begin to drill that in. Uh, there are signs of uh, turnaround. Uh, even before the uh, uh, Trump verdict came in, uh, some polls were showing. Uh, under certain circumstances, uh, particularly the best informed voters um, and the most likely voters uh, were beginning to move in uh, the direction of the Democrats, which it has time to do. Uh, I think it's aided by the uh, Trump verdict, which we can talk about. Um, we have some significant pivot points we have uh, uh, the uh, debate, which may or may not show uh, uh, the, the concerns about uh, uh, Biden's age uh, to be warranted or not warranted. You know, if he comes across uh, any nearly as well as he did in the uh, uh, State of the Union. Yeah, he uh, was good. Uh, well, of course, he was also scripted there. So, uh, uh, and uh, from everything we know, he does have bad moments, and it's a matter of whether he can uh, uh, hold up uh, during that uh, period. He certainly uh, can show uh, uh, Trump up to be a babbler, as he did. Uh, tr I think Trump. Uh, one of the reasons Trump lost the last election was his uh, insane performance uh, and arguments and trying to talk over Biden, uh, you know, four years ago. Uh, and Trump has done nothing but deteriorate since then. So, you know, uh, uh, there's a big if. And if, if uh, uh, Biden holds up uh, reasonably well during that. And if Trump performs as we've seen him perform, uh, that will be another boost toward him. And even though these things are taking, uh, 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 going to be before the conventions, uh, there'll be the sentencing thing, uh, three days before the Republican convention, uh, there will be reaction to the sentencing, uh, well, let's switch over to that that very question. What is your take on the Trump verdict? I have a lot of people asking me. I I don't have a position or a line on it yet. I'm just hoping that it diminishes him <laughs> in some way. What's your sense of it? Well, all the polling, pre-verdict and the early stuff, the last day or two, um, post-verdict, uh, suggests that he will lose a lot of support. Uh, one poll showed that 49% of independents who he seriously needs uh, believe he should drop out of the race. Now, whether they will vote against him, uh, if that, if anywhere near that kind, number of independents votes against him, as we hope, um, it'll be pretty devastating. He will lose, at least by the polling we've seen to date. Um, he'll lose a lot of Republicans. So right now, he, he has a number of Republicans who say that they will vote against him. 
uh, is are enough to defeat him. Uh, it's quite possible. Uh, however, like all the polling, you know, the negative polling, uh, the negative polling about uh, 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 Biden that's been going on for the last uh, um, six months at least, um, can be discounted. And so uh, uh, the, the positive polling that is emerging uh, might also be discounted. I think it's much too early uh, to tell. We've got to let the uh, verdict sink in. Uh, and it's uh, going to take, I, I, I wouldn't trust uh, uh, a poll as being anywhere near predictive for, oh, probably uh, by the time of the Democratic Convention. And uh, there is another um, potential breakpoint. If, uh, if the Democratic Convention turns out to be unruly and uh, uh, bitter and uh, police are involved and heaven knows what, it could be very destructive as it was in 1968. If the uh, uh, Johnson administration here wakes up and uh, establishes a decent protest area and begins to give permits that uh, are more in line with our civil liberties, uh, we certainly uh, uh, can avoid many of those problems. But once again, that's, that's a potential bump in the road. And um, I don't like the direction at the moment, but it is not too late to uh, uh, prevent a catastrophe. And, yeah, well, you you and I were both around for the last one, or well, not the last one, the the one in '68. Uh, you were with the mobilization, and I was uh, I was in the streets, and I got photographed trying to tip over a paddy wagon, which we got a lot of uh, a lot of accolades for over the years, but we never did tip it over. I just want to be clear about that. But I uh, it's I, a great I, photo. I still treasure it. <laughs> I uh, I recently was interviewed by you, someone from USA Today, and I'm not sure what they were. They were talking about the Palestinian demonstrations and encampments going on and wanted to know kind of where I was at on the uh, the coming Democratic convention. And I, I said something to the effect of, I don't want to be like a revisionist, but I kind of think that uh, back then we played into the hands of the election of uh, Richard Nixon. And I hope that uh, it, that that really doesn't repeat itself. I mean, there are going to be a lot of demonstrations. There's a lot of people planning to show up, and um, we'll see what happens. I'm uh, I'm hoping that though uh, people see that uh, we certainly have a choice between two people. None of us really wanted either of them, but one is way better than the other. And we do have to. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, try to neutralize to some extent uh, those people who consider themselves uh, pro-Palestinian. I'm not talking about the out-and-out anti-Semites. Uh, uh, that's uh, different. But the the uh, uh, Palestinians who are threatening to leave the Democratic Party or not vote for Biden, you know, are making a a, a great great mistake. Uh, and uh, my hope is that uh, uh, when they examine the choice they're really going to have, uh, most of those uh, are going to come home. Uh, it's very important they do because that is uh, another uh, uh, potential difficulty, or it's a difficulty now. And it, it, uh, uh, if it goes on, um, that can be very, very bad for Biden. Uh, the numbers who are protesting um, in uh, <clears throat> the key states um, are enough to defeat them. And if they, if they are rational people, I understand, I sympathize uh, with their view. Um, I think, you know, the Palestinians are being uh, very ill-treated and uh, uh, I'm, I want that war to end. And uh, uh, even though Biden uh, you know, they think that Biden can end the war. 
which is a mistake because uh, Netanyahu has his own survival there. He's simply not going to listen uh, very well to, to Biden, who is moving certainly in the right direction now. Uh, yeah, I have a sense that, uh, you know, particularly, I mean, there's a, a larger population of uh, Palestinians, I think, here in Cook County than there is up there in Michigan. But it's all been, the talk has all been about the Michigan uh, Arab community and them talking about not voting for Biden. But I think they're probably highly politically conscious as a group compared to a lot of other groups. And I have a feeling that they will come around. And I, I'm not sure Michigan is as much danger as I thought at one time. Well, I hope that's right. I, I tend to agree because I think uh, uh, when they realize that rooting, in effect, rooting for Hamas is uh, uh, going to make just uh, a hellish world uh, yeah. uh, for them, uh, how <laughs> Hamas uh, uh, doesn't give a damn about its own citizenry. You know, they're happy to see destruction because that uh, empowers them. Uh, so, well, uh, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit, Don. Yeah. I, uh, I was at a memorial for Slim Coleman, Walter Slim Coleman, who I'm sure you know. Uh, very well. He just passed away, and I will always be grateful to the work he did around registering voters for Harold Washington and that victory. Um, the uh, the memorial service this past Thursday was at Operation Push down in Hyde Park. And, um, you know, there was a good crowd there. And one of the things that really caught my attention, though, was uh, the aging leaders that we still have in positions of influence. Uh, not only Jesse Jackson, who, uh, you know, he clearly is in a wheelchair, not in real good shape. I watched people come up to him. Chewy Garcia was really great, and he's not that old, but we had Danny Davis. We had uh, uh, Bobby Rush, who was one of the founders of the Black Panther Party here in Chicago and a longtime congressman. Um, and it just occurred to me that uh, while there were some young people there and kind of cadre from uh, Slim's uh, church and his his organizing work, I'm wondering where you're at on future leaders in Chicago. Who's coming up? Who uh, who you may be aware of that uh, we might look to for the future? Because some of these fellows are not going to be in office for too much longer. Yeah, well, I don't think we're going to see um, the kind of mass leadership we once saw when uh, we had more narrow means of communication. Uh, uh -huh. I think they're going to be dissipated by. Uh, the internet and uh, all the social media. Uh, when I look to potential leaders, one of the people that I am admiring right now, uh, in addition to uh, 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 your alderman out there in uh, 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 Maria Haddon in the 49th. Maria Haddon, and uh, um, uh, I think Matt Martin has uh, uh, a very good chance to become uh, uh, somewhat of a significant political leader uh, as we see him uh, going. He's uh, uh, influential. He's on the right side of things. Uh, he strikes a balance between the uh, farthest left uh, uh, city council, city council people, uh, older people, whatever we're calling them these days, uh, <laughs> just alders. How about that? Uh, they're alders, not elders. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I see there now I'm not on the ground anymore. I'm you know, pretty much, um, you know, I go, I get, I get out and do things, but I uh, don't have any firsthand observations of uh, some of the leaders on the street, uh, the kind of people like Bobby Rush who, goodness, I remember helping along through uh, uh, defeat after defeat when I was running for state rep, and then he finally uh, uh, had a great victory. Um, I helped Danny Davis from the day he uh, uh, was trying to be a campaign manager, not just uh, 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 before he actually achieved office. So I know all these people, and their, their influences 
uh, certainly declining um, as happens. And I don't know, uh, I can't spot anybody um, out of office who is not who is not, not an office holder who is rising on the streets. I just don't know who's out there in Hyde Park or Inglewood or um, uh, far, farther south areas. There are certainly um, no leadership organizations such as we had in the 60s, like with the Coordinating Council of Community Organizations. So uh, uh, the best I can look to right now are a couple of uh, uh, alders, one woman, Ms. Haddon, and uh, uh, one guy, uh, Matt Martin. Uh, they're, they're, they're my um, people I tell, I, I tell the other members of the press, uh, keep their eye on these two. Good. Well, I'm going to keep my eye on you as long as I can, and uh, we welcome you back maybe next month again. I don't know what your next column is going to be, but I look forward to them every week. And I think people, if they want to uh, read an interesting write, piece of work every week, they should go to your column, which I guess they have to get hit you up at donrose at aol.com and then get signed up. You they can do that, or they can they, they can go to my Facebook column, which is open to everyone. Okay, I, I, I do post it there. Great to talk to you, and I'll see you soon, brother. Always. All right. Power to the people. <laughs>
filled with beautiful art treasures, including sculpture by Mr. Imagination. Um, we're also working with the city to obtain the lot directly across the street and all together create a cultural campus. And uh, to do that, we are on pins and needles waiting for a grant from the city, which would allow us to purchase the site and pay for a partial development and reconstruction and repurposing. And the basic idea is to make it a hub of organizing and uh, you know culture from uh, throughout throughout the world and also in Bronzeville, which is where it's located. Well, that's so really that's exciting. The short answer. No, that's a great, and I'm really excited that you're able to do this. It's, it's a short thing. You're going to get this grant, and you're going to be able to get the property and do some building, and at least get it started. I, I feel confident, actually. I mean, we have so many people who are spiritually connected, and from their lips to God's ears, so I feel like it's it's probably going to happen. And so to get to where we are today, a lot of people have donated money and otherwise, you know, 37 years of goodwill and performances and, you know, great, great relationships. So it feels special and good and be great to locate a project like Hot House in Brownsville. Yeah, I'd look, I'm looking forward to that. Well, one of the reasons that I uh, asked you to come on the show again was, um, that you have a film festival. Uh, you know, there's a lot of film festivals out there. I'm overwhelmed. I, I don't go to a lot of film festivals. I do watch some films. I'm in some films. But I was really impressed with all of the films that you have coming up in this film festival. So let's talk about it. Let's uh, give us the overview, and then maybe let's focus on some of these films, what they're all about, from Betty Boop to Malcolm yeah. X. How's it going? <laughs> Thanks. Um... So our good friend, our mutual friend, Peter Kuttner and I have uh, collaborated for many years, starting almost, I guess, more uh, decidedly during COVID where we were committed to presenting online content for free. But even before that, starting in kind of 2010, we were doing a lot of uh, attenuated uh, social cause social justice programs that were uh, multidisciplinary, but had a strong uh, film component to them. And uh, he and I, I think, both share a love of uh, films that are uh, chestnuts from, you know, decades in the past, either they're guerrilla TV or uh, video or other kinds of social documentary commentary that really just don't get seen very often, um, even with a, a lot of film festivals that are mostly feature uh, feature films. So it's a lot of fun to try to unearth um, these kind of nuggets from uh, that, that really have great cinematography, cinema verite, kind of on the street, um, documents. And so this series, because it's uh, yet another Chicago uh, Democratic convention with, uh, the with a president who's not even uh, going to make the scene. Um, so we thought it's a, it's a great uh, moment to try and unearth and discuss and present uh, kind of odds and ends from the dustbins of history. Some things people know about. Some are some are kind of classic features like the Great Dictator and All the King's Men and Parallax View, which are which are commercial films. A lot of people have seen them. But one thing we've noticed in these uh, presentations is that with younger people who are mostly used to seeing things on Netflix or TCM or you know, uh, other kinds of streaming platforms, that there's just a lot of content that even with so much content isn't really uh, shown. So Peter found um, Punishment Park and uh, A Grin Without a Cat. 
And I found El Grito and all three of these movies, I think are really, really uh, compelling watching. So we've been partnering with Can TV, which is uh, Chicago Cable Access. And the reason why we, we like to work with them is because it's a, it's a platform that reaches throughout Chicago, kind of beyond our own hothouse abilities to connect with people. Um, I've been in gyms working out where Can TV is on. And, you know, it's it's a platform that was negotiated uh, for on behalf of the people. So we want to support it. And so a lot of the films are on Can TV Channel 21 on Saturday nights, starting this Saturday at 7 p.m. And then also we're presenting films that people can watch anytime through our email or website. And those are just links that we've provided where people can click and watch uh, at their leisure. So they're all free. The name of the festival is Unconventional. I'm really impressed with the, the list of films and it starts after this show airs on Saturday. Um, and just uh, let me, little footnote, we are on Can TV at nine o'clock on Thursdays each week. Oh. And um, uh, your film festival is going to run from June 6th to June 6th. July 6th. Then there's a, the, the uh, also anytime people want to watch, they can go to uh, your website, uh, et cetera, to see like Medium Cool, El Grito, Punishment Park. A Grin Without a Cat. These are all films I don't know much about except Medium Cool. No, you'll uh, like Punishment Park, Michael. It's, kind of, it's up your alley. It's a bunch of uh, dissidents who are rounded up by Nixon's goon squats and given a choice between like running for their life or, I don't know, it's some wacky 60s. Well, let's so, start with the, uh, let's <laughs> just talk a little bit about some of these films and you give us a little uh, synopsis or detail. Starting after this show, later tonight on Saturday, we're talking, um, you've got Betty Boop for President, which was made in 1932, and The Great Dictator, which I think has Charlie Chaplin in it back in 1940. How about filling this, give us a little on those two films. Well, Betty Boop's a short cartoon. We we thought we'd start out easy and kind of everybody loves Betty Boop. Um, and the, the Great Dictator with the great Charlie Chaplin. I think uh, we, we love Charlie Chaplin, not only for his artistic uh, over and his great uh, body of work, but, you know, for his political uh, point of view and his solidarity with people. And um, mentioning Cuba later, uh, there's a Charlie Chaplin theater in Cuba. And so that there's also a nod uh, through connection. Next week, uh, you've got some heavier films coming up. You've got The Ballot on the Bullet, which I think is Malcolm X, Freedom on My Mind, and Nation Time. Fill us in on those three films. Well, I also want to say that um, since you and I talked, um, Kank TV is going to show Jesse Jackson on Friday night, sort of, sort of one day early. So uh, they're going to screen the Jesse Jackson speech Friday night at 7. So that actually starts the festival on Kank TV. Then it follows the next day with Betty Boop and well, some Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> Some people will get to hear about this on Friday mornings. We're on Lumpen Radio now. And oh, okay. And on Lumpen. Cool. And also well, so the next the next three up, uh, June on um, June fifteenth at seven, Channel nineteen, Channel twenty one. Um, you know, a lot of people have seen the uh, Malcolm X ballad or the bullet. It's a it's a short uh, speech that he gave in nineteen sixty four. It has sort of an inflammatory you know, title, but I think his point is interesting because it's sort of like, you know, people who are denied uh, access to to channels of uh, empowerment, uh, uh, you know, consider other, other options. So that's kind of his speech. And, you know, it's, you can't have a festival without Malcolm X. Um, 
Freedom on My Mind is a, a piece I'm really interested in seeing, which is Connie Field's uh, movie from 1994. And it uh, focuses on the Freedom Summer of, in Mississippi. And oh. what I think is so interesting about this movie is really, you know, you can't underestimate or under uh, acknowledge how courageous and fearless the people who went south to register people to vote in spite of extremely violent, deadly circumstances. And so that film, you know, kind of highlights and then the the punchline is sort of a triumphant one. But, um, you know, in this day and age, I think it's really important that people like you were talking with Don, who sort of are of the opinion like, oh, it's all the same. We're tired of, you know, the capitalist, democratic, whatever. You know, I think it really helps to reflect like how how much is at stake and how, you know, people who actually organize and commit can can turn really horrible situations around. And I think it's an, it's really important to keep thinking about that because, you know, it's a marathon. I think I just want to make a comment on that. Uh, for the younger people who may be listening, summer of 1964 was really something else. It was when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had recruited people, both black and white, to come to Mississippi to do voter registration. People got killed down there. People got beat up. A lot of negative stuff happened, but it really set the groundwork for, you could even look at Georgia today with two Democratic senators that, you know, kind of goes back to those, those roots. And I remember I had just graduated from college and was working in Uptown for some anthropologists studying Southern white migrants that summer of 64. And I remember reading the papers every day just so excited about what I heard or disappointed or angry or upset about the activity that was going on that summer. And, um, you know, people today, everybody supposedly gets to vote, but people couldn't vote then, you know? Well, it, uh, I mean, I think it's also so important, Michael, to, to keep reminding people that the things that we gained are not etched in stone and that we have to keep fighting for them. It's it's an ever, you know, freedom is a constant struggle. And, you know, we have to keep uh, reminding young people that even, you know, things that we thought were settled, like, you know, abortion rights or voting rights or clean water or many things are, are under attack. And um, what I think these movies show is that, you know, these were ordinary people uh, not extraordinary people, but ordinary people who felt uh, compelled to action, and they found a way to join other people, uh, and to and collectively and together they were um, able to to make uh, substantial, significant change in the world. And so, you know, part of the reason we're showing some of these movies is to you know, to look back, but also to, to and you know, to make a statement about empowerment at a time when so many people feel disempowered and cynical and frustrated and, you know, not, they don't have a way to really connect in a, um, in a serious way to affect change. And so we're always um, also reminding people about the Movement Voter Project which is a superly important national way for young people, everybody to connect on a local level to these races that are happening all over the country. So we're trying to find ways for people not only to be, you know, entertained through historical lens, but to to f find a way to actually act <laughs> between now and November. Right on. <laughs> and to join other people who want to to keep a forward momentum. Well, what's this Nation Time, which is going to be on on June fifteenth? Uh, Nation Time, nineteen seventy-two. Uh, it sounds like we're really in. We're in Nation Time again. What's going to happen to the nation? But tell us about that film. <laughs> well, we 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 screened this movie uh, once before, but it's it's a great uh, document by William Graves, who is an African American filmmaker. 
It's a document of the National Black Political Convention, which was held in Gary, Indiana in 1972. It features Shirley Chisholm, Dick Gregory, Harry Belafonte, Coretta King, Betty Shabazz, and Mary Baraka. And some of these, you know, what's, it's, what's rare is that uh, the Black point of view, African-American point of view from these uh, earlier decades, I think is really important. And so there was another convention in Oakland, a uh, Black uh, political convention, that the only re uh, remaining document is the audio file. So, you know, we feel it's really important to have these first voice narratives that are from the community, talking about the community. And uh, Nation Time, I think, is a great movie that has an insider look at the emerging Black, uh, black power, political power movement of the time. It's very exciting. Uh, let's keep going along. We'll move. We're going from Saturday to Saturday. Let's do June twenty second. You've got two of them. You've got Viva La Casa made in nineteen seventy two, and All the King's Men nineteen forty nine. What are those two about? <laughs> Viva La Casa. So we, you know, we wanted to talk about a little bit because on the, we could have a seventeen year film festival, but we wanted to touch on some of the. Um, you know, the, the struggles that actually had a lot of agency and purpose and gained a lot of uh, success. Uh, so one of those was uh, the Latino, Chicano, uh, Mexicano uh, movement that was, uh, you know, largely successful in California with uh, emerging out of the great boycotts and uh, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. And so um, this movie is a document of that time from the 70s and how effective uh, organizing was in strikes and the great boycott and uh, changing the labor dynamics and financial arrangements with um, the grape growers and other kinds of labor struggles that were happening at that time. And All the King's Men is the, you know, it's kind of the classic Roderick Crawford uh, running as a, a populist in Louisiana through 1949. All right. Uh, it's it's sort of a great uh, parallel in some ways to the buffoon uh, in, in the felon, the new felon, uh, you know, in, in the sense where everybody sort of walks away from, from him in the end. And I think uh, that's, you know, it's hopefully prognostic of uh, everyone's going to walk away. I, I remember film. that film. I liked it. Who was the guy, uh, the actor, Andy? Broder Crawford. Uh-huh. Well, anyhow, yes. you know, rather than me have you go down this list, I'm going to mention a few of these, and then I'm going to switch gears, because I think every week for the next few weeks, I'm going to uh remind people that they can watch them but on june 29th you've got harvey milk you've got nixon i am not a crook <laughs> you've got the parallax view and communists on campus the following week which is july 6th angela davis and gus hall uh jesse jackson for president cover up behind the iran contra affair tell us how they look at the uh, the films that you have, they can watch any time. And then I'm gonna ask you about your trips to Cuba. The best way for people to watch the films anytime is to join the Hot House mailing list, which you can do by going to hothouse.net, which is our web. At the top of the page, there's a join our mailing list. You will then get emails from us, which have the links to watch the films. We also try to post them on Facebook with the link on Facebook. I've been really aware that you do regularly as you organize trips to Cuba. And uh, we're both fans of the Cuban Revolution and uh, wishing a lot of support in that direction. Tell us about uh, the most recent trip to Cuba and your future plans on that. Well, Hot House goes twice a year in January in the summer. And we're also making a film 
uh, in Guantanamo called The Other Guantanamo, which is about musicians and cultural uh, organizers in the town. We are uh, taking in group June 19th and another, the next group after that will be in January for the, the Havana Jazz Festival. Ooh. We're committed to people to people exchange and each trip we bring a large quantity of uh, much needed humanitarian aid, medicine, uh, some food stuff. Uh, people are very much uh, suffering maintenance of the Cuba on the state sponsor of terrorism list. So essentially, uh, the country's been closed off to you know essential supplies, food, fuel to transport food, uh, medicines, and the rest. And so even though it's somewhat symbolic, we still try to bring as much as we can um, to, to give to people um, anyway. So people can find out more about all of our work um, on our website, hothouse.net. Marguerite, let me uh, let me ask you just briefly because we're running out of time. Um, do you, I don't think much will happen around any more fairness from the U.S. toward Cuba, certainly before the election. But are there any people still actively challenging our current status and the way we treat Cuba? And the embargo that we I would say, away. yeah, there's a lot, there's hundreds of people around the country, thousands. I mean, the two, I think, significant uh, folks are the Puentes de Amor people in Miami, which are Cuban American, uh, led by Carlos Laza. And then I would say Code Pink. And uh, you can, you know, I think the best thing for, your viewers and listeners might be to look at Belly of the Beast, which is on YouTube. That's a series of documentaries where people are talking about uh, the law, things, activism, things, Belly of the Beast on YouTube, Code Pink, and Puentes de Amor. And in Chicago, we have the Chicago Cuba Coalition. Thank you so much for coming on, Marguerite. Got a lot of information. Thanks, in Michael. There. Thanks yep. for all you do. Thank you, too. And Appreciate I want to you. thank everybody who was making this show possible today, particularly our guests, Don Rose and Marguerite Hortberg. I want to thank the engineer, Hal James. I want to thank our executive producers, Katie Hogan, Lynn Orman, and Tom Clark. And I want to remind people that we do have to pay out some money to make this show possible. So we are in the midst of our first fundraising raising drive in since before the pandemic. So please get a hold of us if any of you want to help out and continue to make this show possible. Everybody out there, keep, keep doing good in the world. The world needs all the good that you do, that Marguerite does, that Hal does, that Don Rose does, et cetera, et cetera. Together, we do Tell make a difference. So till next week, remember, do all power to the people. Are you doing Over and out. You can. Mm -hmm. Over the we want to thank you for watching the Live from the Heartland show. New episodes air every Friday beginning at 9 a.m. Central Time. Episodes air each following Thursday on Can TV, 9 p.m. in Sweet Home Chicago on Channel 21 or streaming everywhere else at cantv.org. Audio episodes go live on WLUW each Saturday, 9 a.m. on the left end of your dial at 88.7 FM or streaming everywhere worldwide at WLUW.org. They're available on Apple and Spotify podcasts by looking up Live from the Heartland on either platform and are also broadcast on Lumpen Radio each Friday at 9 a.m. on 105.5 FM and streaming at LumpenRadio.com. I'm Michael James, and I'm glad to have been your host. Until next time, remember, do good in the world because the world needs all the good that you do, that I do, that we do together. All power to the people, over and out. Come to Lim, are you doing the best you can?
tell me, are you doing? 